And let me once again welcome everybody officially to today's online event, Nine Imperatives for Leadership of 311 Enabled Government. This event is sponsored by the Harvard Kennedy School's Leadership for a Networked World Program and the Government Innovators Network. I'd like to turn things over to the moderator for today's event, Mayor Stephen Goldsmith, who is the Director of the Innovations in American Government Program here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, uh, Jim, and welcome, everybody. Um, this is an uh, exciting conversation. Uh, first, my uh, compliments to Zach Tuman, my uh, colleague at Harvard, for his work in the Leadership of the Network World Program and the convenings he's had about 311. I'm the uh, director of the uh, uh, Innovations of the American Government Program at the Kennedy School, and that program has been giving awards to 311 uh, for some time, actually. And and watching as they've gotten progressively, those programs have gotten progressively better and deeper and broader, uh, you know, going from a simple uh, centralized call center to a uh, front door to some pretty sophisticated performance management uh, tools. So this is a very exciting conversation. We've got a great group of presenters. Uh, Jim has information on each of them, so I don't want to occupy the time with a, with a lot of introductions. And in fact, what I think I'll do is introduce them together and uh, ask for short presentations at the end of these presentations. Then we'll take questions from the audience and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do these presentations uh, uh, one after another. If a member of the, of the uh, audience has a particularly germane question at the end of one of these, at the point of clarification, please feel free to kind of do the card and uh, we'll call on you. Uh, but we'll, you also have a chance to go back at these guys later. So. Um, let me introduce Michael Sarasi, Manager of Strategic Customer Research and Development, uh, Miami Dade's Government Information Center, a terrific uh, application in Miami Dade. Neil Evans, the 311 Project Director in Toronto. Uh, Joe Morrisro, uh, Deputy Commissioner, of New York's uh, Impressive 311 and uh, NYFC.gov. Uh, Gerard Gallant, General Manager, Public Service 311 for Motorola, obviously a key. Uh, a partner in, in many of these uh, 311 uh, uh, better utilizations and Zach himself. So with that, uh, Mike, let me call on you to begin. Excellent. Hope everyone is doing well. Uh, my name is Mike Sarasti. I am a manager of customer research over at Miami-Dade County Government Information Center. Um, we've been asked to come today to talk a little bit um, about 311, specifically where we're looking to go with 311 over the course of the next year. Um, and we have a term we use quite often called uh, seamless service delivery. Um, it's this idea that the customer should have a uh, choice as to how they interact with government. And this interaction, these interactions should be consistent across all the different service channels. Basically the service channel of their choice, they should be able to get the same information across those channels um, in, a, in an easy fashion. So a little backdrop for what we're doing um, in Miami-Dade County. Uh, 311, our answer center was launched in 2004. It's the uh, first multi-jurisdictional call center, uh, 311 answer center, not for non-emergency services in the nation. Um, and it serves uh, 2.4 million residents in Miami-Dade County and 35 municipalities. So again, we are multi-jurisdictional. Um, we take calls for City of Miami and a number of other municipalities. Um, throughout the county. Uh, the Government Information Center was actually created in 2006, and the idea behind the creation of that was to consolidate the county service channels. Both 311 and MiamiDade.gov, our county web portal, were consolidated at that time under the same department. That consolidation grew in 2007. We merged with the Communications Department, giving us uh, now instead of just having kind of that service channel, we also have the uh, communication channel where we can do some push messaging as well. So I created a pretty unique vantage point for understanding the customer experience for us. Um, aside from, from having the service channels, we've got a unit, which is the unit that I'm a part of, um, the Customer Service Advocacy Unit, which um, does a lot in terms of understanding the data that comes out of these, these different service channels um, and all those interactions. It's also important to know we also have, uh, we're not an IT department, as you know, um, MiamiDade.gov. Um, in, in a lot of locations is actually housed in IT departments, being that it's specifically related to the user experience as 311 is related to the user experience. We also have kind of an in-house team, um, IT team dedicated specifically to service channels dealing with the user experience. 
So how do we enable our customers to have a positive and seamless experience with government? That's what we're going to talk about today, some initiatives that we're specifically looking at over the next four years. I'm sorry, the next year, four different initiatives uh, that we're looking to bring us even closer to this, aside from what we've already tried to do to get everything in the same place. As I said, step one was alignment, getting everything um, in the same place so we'd be able to make some moves. That brought us to um, oh, slide there. Additional call center consolidations. Currently, right now, we have uh, we take calls for a number of departments. We've got a few that are kind of on the docket looking forward. The second initiative I'm going to talk about is a customer service intelligence initiative, which is basically a business intelligence initiative, our portal knowledge based integration initiative, and our what we call very mysteriously the third portal. Let me get to that. Consolidations. Important to note, last year we uh, brought on the uh, Miami Bay Transit in 2007. And we brought in 27 uh, call center reps from uh, Miami Bay Transit. This did quite a bit to transcend, transcend the natural perception that 311 was a complaint center. Beyond that, known as a complaint center, we're also in, down here in South Florida known as the Hurricane Hotline. And that was just kind of an issue of timing when we launched in, 2000, uh, in 2004. We had a series of hurricanes that came through over those over its initial startup. Um, so a lot of people actually knew 311 is kind of the hurricane hotline. So bringing in transit on board helped uh, a lot kind of take people away from some of those initial um, preconceptions about what we do and know that you can also call and do trip routing straight to the 311 answer center. So going beyond the complaint, we're actually really making sure that people understand that you can get all sorts of government services and government information through the answer center. One of the consolidations that we're looking forward for the next year is bringing in water and sewer. Um, so we're currently assessing that, and the key function coming out of that is bill payment, which would really totally change what we do uh, in that we take, um, we take payments at the call center, which currently doesn't happen. Now we currently take a lot of payments um, through, um, some of our, through our online channel through miamidate.gov. So a successful consolidation here would do quite a bit to strengthen the customer's ability to transact in their method of choice. Currently, if you're going to make a payment, you've got to go online or you've got to call water and sewer directly to make a payment for water. Bringing them on board again would, uh, would strengthen that tie as a, as a seamless government experience. Our CSI initiative. This is again our customer service um, intelligence initiative. And for a long time, we've had a motto basically counting what counts. Uh, how do our metrics support our entire organization, Miami Dade County's enterprise performance management strategy? Um, what are we doing to support um, the decision makers at the top levels? We've um, employed quite a few multi-mode feedback strategies at the 301 Answer Center. We have what we call the closed loop program, which is uh, basically follow-up calls once a service request has been completed. Follow-up calls, calls to the customer to make sure that the service request is completed to their satisfaction. Um, a number of surveys, and again, we've got a number of feedback strategies across service channels. So, being that they're all at the same place, there's often relationships between. Um, between these customer experiences, and we like to make sure that we not only look at them, but we present them in an aggregate fashion so people can see in its entirety what the customer experience looks like in Miami Dade County. We've had service staff for a while, which is an uh, online tool that we use that gives kind of some insight into 301 data in real time. Uh, and we've had that for a while. The CSI initiative is really taking it to the next level and using Cognos as an engine. Um, which is a business intelligence tool. What that's going to let us do is um, we're in the process of creating a data warehouse that houses all our 311 data, our data from our web portal, um, and from a number of department sources. So we can look at customer service delivery from a consolidated space. Very important, you know, as call volume as call volume increases, are there uh, increases also occurring on the web? What are people calling about? What are people doing web searches about? This tool is going to let us actually finally look at all this um, in a consolidated fashion. So very important initiative for us this year. PKBI. PKBI is what we call our portal knowledge base integration. Um, and whereas you know, customer service intelligence tells us a lot about um, what people are calling about, PKBI does a lot in terms of helping us with knowledge management. Um, and it's always a challenge making sure that the knowledge that we have at the 301 Answer Center is current. Not just that it's current, but that it's also synchronized with the information that's on the web. Again, creating a, a, a seamless experience all the way um, across our channels. Um, so we, again, I mentioned we've got an in-house technology um, um, unit that handles a lot of these integrations. So this unit is 
specifically in charge of making uh, designing a tool specifically for us that um, looks at our three one one uh, application that we use um, and making sure that that's integrating seamlessly that it updates and synchronizes any time that a change is made on our web portal. Another aspect that this is going to um, help us with is what I call the uh, the health of the knowledge base. Um, a lot of times. In our model, the departments are actually responsible for keeping up the topics related to their specific department. Some departments naturally a lot better than others at keeping this information current and up to date. So PKBI is also going to give us um, some measures regarding specific topics. The answer, uh, the agents will actually be able to specifically rate the call specialist at the call center will be able to rate these topics um, as to whether it's a good topic, well written, poorly written. Um, we'll have that intelligence and be able to feed that back to departments and let them know, listen, you're not doing a very good job here at keeping up your topic, um, or you're doing a great job. You know, in comparison, we'll be able to look at it across the entire organization and who's top tier and, and who's kind of um, at the tail end. So it's a great tool that's going to help us um, keep the information current and consistent across all the channels. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention that we're doing, um, again, the mysterious third portal. The third portal, the first portal being our 311 Answer Center. The second portal being MiamiDate.gov. The third portal refers to our in-person customer experience. So everything from you walking up to a local location or um, you know, to a physical location somewhere, maybe at a strip mall, or potentially a kiosk um, at, at various locations throughout the county. Um, the third portal kind of encompasses all of that. Um, we're currently in the process of redesigning our, our outreach function for the county, actually reaching out into the communities, again, the in-person component. Um, and we're actually using our in-house customer service consultants. We're using our own 311 call specialists who have been dealing on the front lines with customer service issues for so long and so effectively now to actually be our outreach uh, representatives. So they're actually out on the field, on location, or they're going to be out on location um, on the front lines in person, kind of again bridging that um, bridging that divide between the in person experience for the customer and the 311 answer center. Um, and currently we're looking at again not just not just doing it, but we want to make sure the customer understands that this is that this is one one experience. And we've branded currently um, we have our service direct application, which is our online uh, service request intake application. And we're taking that brand and we're basically making that, that the umbrella brand over our entire customer service experience across all service channels. So if a customer comes over and sees the service direct brand, they'll know that they'll able to get that service via phone through our 311 answer center, via online, or via the in-person experience and the uh, method of their choice. That's all I got for you. <laughs> that was pretty impressive for. Uh all you have for us. We'll come back and ask more questions for you later. Let me now ask uh, uh, Gerald Gallant from uh, uh, No, I'm sorry, I skipped a couple people. Neil Evans from Toronto to uh, follow up as well. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for not forgetting us Canadians up here. Um, that's a pretty scary picture I put on there, but I hope I don't put uh, too many people off. As it says, I am the uh, uh, project director here in uh, Toronto uh, 311. Um, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity. Um, I was not available at the Harvard uh, lead-off for uh, this leadership conference, but I was able to participate in the one in Windsor, Ontario, and I thought it was very um, a good discussion, and therefore I'm glad to participate uh, today. I just want to uh, lay a perspective out on where Toronto 311 is at this point. Um, we are uh, a population of 2.5 million, and of note, uh, that half of our uh, citizens are born outside Canada, and you can imagine how that's going to play into a 301. We are the sixth largest government in Canada, uh, which is uh, important because we're a municipal government, um, and we have provincial level and a federal level. So that puts us into some perspective of how large uh, of a population and uh, of services we need to uh, be able to provide for our citizens. Um, we uh, in Canada here we got started uh, a little late uh, with a 311. Uh, Toronto was part of the original application to our uh, our government agency, the CRTC, to get the 311 number uh, approved, and that happened uh, in Canada in 2004. Um, Toronto was, uh, was at uh, the forefront with a number of other uh, partners in, in making sure that that happened. Uh, Toronto began our 311 trip 
uh, in two, oops, somehow that just jumped up there in 2005, and uh, we're look, uh, looking to go launch in June 2008. So it's been four years in the making. Um, we understand that we'll be the second largest uh, 311 in North America, right behind our New York friends there. Uh, and that's based on agents. We'll uh, begin with uh, 122 FTEs and about 150 uh, customer service reps. So I just tried to add some perspective. I'm going to uh, take a little bit of uh, different uh, look at this um, because we're um, we're not live. We have uh, some advantages and some disadvantages. One of the advantages is we can stand back and look at everybody else and um, uh, take the best. And we certainly have learned a lot from our Canadian and American friends that are already up and running. But the three uh, items I want to propose up here are uh, what what we consider to be trends that we'll be looking at in the uh, in the next. Uh, year and beyond, and I want to uh, take a few minutes just to discuss them. I selected them not because they were necessarily most important, but they were definitely something that I think other municipalities share. And uh, as I understand from my discussions uh, through the, uh, uh, um, the leadership, that they uh, will likely be uh, thought-provoking. So let me get into um, uh, the first item here, this is the, uh, um, the move from service-centric to a customer-centric organization. I think Toronto, like many municipalities, focus virtually all of our efforts on providing services. Our budgets are set up that way. Our service planning is set up that way. Structures, uh, department objectives are all set up for uh, providing services. We need to, here in the City of Toronto, uh, and I've heard other stock is shift that uh, uh, focus um, from the service centric to the customer centric uh, perspective. Um, this is going to for us in, uh, involve a large amount of organizational change management. It is a huge uh, a huge forty four uh, department um, bureaucracy with fifty four thousand staff. Um, to make those shifts from one end to another to customer service is going to be a big undertaking. We are a service silo. Uh, our divisions are based on service. One division doesn't necessarily talk to another division nor the departments. Public sectors are usually uh, service delivery organizations. I think the motive for change isn't always there because in many cases we have monopolies. Uh, in Toronto here, there's not anywhere else you can go to get solid waste pickup or water. Those kinds of things make us a, uh, a monopoly and, and, and have us less uh, likely to drive to change or the motives for that. So um, one of the examples of where we need to change is, uh, as an example, uh, back a number of months ago we delivered a program that we call the BINS program. And we were to deliver to each household in the City of Toronto a bin so you can no longer put your garbage in your own um, a container or with your own bags, you have to now put them in a government provided bin. And uh, certainly we started to drive those bins out with no sense of customer service. And today we're uh, in our program, our, uh, our 338 bins program, we're taking 40,000 calls a day and we're only able to manage 1,200. So we've got about 38,000 people that are angry at us every day. Uh, that's an example of where in Toronto here, we need to focus more on customer-centric than on service-centric. Um, and, and I think the motive for, for municipalities in this, and again, up in Canada here, we've got a nationwide survey, which is called Citizens First, which surveys levels of government from federal, provincial, and municipal. And uh, they, sur they survey them every two years on customer service and service drivers. And one of their big findings is that the increase in customer satisfaction is directly uh, connected to the increase that the citizen has in their government. And I think the better we're, we're understanding, the better service we're able to provide is the more uh, increase in the confidence that the citizens have in their level of government. In each of these slides, I try and end with a sort of a question that I leave out there. And it's, so what would be the motive in other municipalities to make these changes? Certainly in ours, to provide better customer service, but also to inc increase the um, uh, the level of government, uh, the confidence in the level of government. So that kind of leads on to the the next item, and uh, this one I've identified as um, uh, there are three. Uh, I, I use this term triactor. There are three entities that the public represents, and in ours, uh, 
I've identified them as system, uh, citizen, customer, and taxpayer. And they each play uh, their own role. An actor, of course, is uh, interpreted in my case here as one, one who interprets. So as they interpret their perspective of the services we provide, they have three sometimes the same uh, uh, views of government, and sometimes they're, they're opposing views. For example, the citizen who has a role as an advocate in the case of, uh, of uh, certain resources may, be, uh, may believe, for example, that um, money is better spent on uh, public transit than on roads, where, or on roads. Sorry. Whereas the customer, who is the consumer of our services, uh, just clearly may want the pothole to be fixed. That is maybe in contradictory to what the citizen wants, and spend that money on uh, buses or on uh, uh, bicycle pathways. The taxpayer, who is uh, mostly related to a voter, uh, um, their their interest is uh, certainly related to what taxes they pay. Uh, some may not want to pay taxes. Some may want to pay taxes in certain in certain specific areas. For us, uh, in understanding these three groups is very important. And uh, and who is it that we're responsible uh, to? On the first uh, glance, at it, you would say, well, you're responsible to the customer because you're providing customer service, but Toronto here over the next year, we really want to measure uh, customer satisfaction and, uh, and, and relate that into citizen satisfaction, which are likely uh, to be different. Um, and if you look at these triactors, you can see that the citizens, what may satisfy them may be very dis different than satisfies the customer. How do we measure the citizen satisfaction? I think leads, uh, at least in our hope, into one of the ways in this thought-provoking web point uh, two zero uh, approach here. That may be one of the ways in which we can begin to measure this citizen satisfact uh, satisfaction through a 311. So in the month of November here in Toronto, our organization is hosting a web 2.0 conference. And in part of that, we're looking at customer service and how Web 2.0 can be uh, involved in uh, customer service. And I'm just going to highlight a couple of ways in which we're looking to move forward in, in the next year or two. Using Facebook or blogs, for example, um, and they, we can use them to try to start to get a sense of what the citizen's satisfaction is. You don't have to be a customer uh, to engage uh, with that, and what is the value of that. So. We're going to try and use that for some citizen satisfactory uh, web collaboration. Certainly, we're looking to strengthen our customer service chain, and and we know that currently we have a number of of uh, interactions on our website, and many of those are discontinued after a certain period of time. And when we survey those people, we find out that if there was a a opportunity to answer a simple question. In many cases, the question is something like, do I put dashes between the numbers on my credit card? They stop the transaction because they can't get an answer to that. But if we had some collaboration, they would complete those. That would mean a savings to us, and it would mean better customer service. So we're looking at the um, web collaboration for that. Uh, Wikipedia, uh, we talk about updating our internal knowledge base. Um, here in Toronto, our knowledge base will be driven by 311, unlike my friends down there in Minneapolis who have a great idea about uh, connecting their knowledge base to their website so they don't have to maintain it. Here in Toronto, we'll be maintaining it. So we're looking at ways to push that off to uh, the departments to maintain, and one of the avenues may be through a kind of Wikipedia software. Uh, this uh, SMS and text messaging. Um, certainly will enhance the service channels, and specifically for accessibility, our large uh, community here that is deaf. Um, text messaging is a great way for them to communicate. I know that uh, New York, uh, we are looking at them and the, their use for photo and video as attachment to service requests to enhance those pictures worth a thousand words I think is a really good example there. And the last item, of course, the connected to Web uh, 2.0 is this uh, Next uh, generate uh, the net generation, and uh, certainly those are the people that are going to be moved into uh, moving into the homeowners if they're not there at the at the earlier uh, front end, or they're uh, you know they're going to be the um, taxpayers of the future. They're going to be the ones that are going to be defining the service, and how do we connect them? And they're using these products, um, and and uh, in connection with that. These are going to be the people we want to hire into our call center. These are the next generation 
uh, the young users, and they are used to these products. We need to have them as part of their um, uh, their repertoire of tools. So uh, that is my opening remarks um, for now. Thank you. That's great. Uh, let me say that um, all of the slides will be posted on a, uh, a site, and at the end, Jim will give uh, details about how to get into it so that you can have them later. Um, let me just um, uh, let me make a, a, a note and then ask you a question before we move on. The, the note is that uh, I've recently convened. Um, I, I'm, I'm fairly active with uh, social entrepreneurs and community service in the United States, and we did convene uh, with Mayor Daly, a group of mayors uh, and Web 2.0 players in that space, to figure out how the tools could help both uh, nominate problems that needed to be solved in the city, but also how people could be involved in solving those. And uh, though the possibility, when we come back, connecting those tools to, to uh, 311 is, is exciting. They, they, and Zach and I are actually looking for 311 operations where the, we can watch the incorporation of 2.0 tools, but not just in bilateral Connections between the citizen and the city, but in uh, in a, uh, a network of citizens to each other, to not for profits, to faith based in the city, because you could imagine that you have lots of folks in your big systems that have similar interests that could band together, not only to harass you, but they could band together to solve the problem. So, uh, Zach might want to come back to that. I think there's great, we have a lot of uh, uh, players in the uh, technology world that would like to participate, and uh, the costs are minimal and the results are high. Here's one last real quick question for you, though. Um, our program gave an award to Service Canada last year, which is you know, widely held up as, as much better than the U.S. as a federal site for uh, information intake. Could you just give us one word or two about the relationship between Toronto and Service Canada? Yeah, sure. That, uh, great question. Um, we have a strong relationship. In fact, we have established uh, at one of our uh, of our uh, uh, in-person uh, walk-up counter services. We call it we call it the try uh, try counter uh, service, and we have been able to uh, have both the federal uh, service Canada, uh, service Ontario, and uh, the Toronto all at one counter, so it is a one-stop shopping. We're looking to take that model and move it out, so you can get anywhere from passport information, which is federal, uh, to provincial health information, change your address, uh, get a sticker, to municipal, pay your uh, your taxes at one counter. So um, we've also established a, a biz. A PAL program, and you can see that on the web, which is if you're starting up a business, you can get at one site, you can get access to all of uh, the requirements you need to start up a business, whether they're federal, or provincial, or uh, municipal requirements. So uh, those are some of the um, more practical customer service ends. Uh, there are a lot of others that are uh, behind the scenes to align political um, and when I say political agendas based on service provision, so those, for example, would be vertical portals, uh, event-driven uh, episodes. Uh, I've had a baby. Um, I've lost my wallet. I've changed my address. Many of those having vertical. So those are the kinds of areas we're looking at. Thank you very much. Okay, Joe. Uh, New York's been held up as a maybe Cadillac's the wrong word, but uh, uh, very interesting connection between them. Your mayor was telling me how he's watching uh, the metrics on his uh, desktop in order to measure the performance of his employees. And so let's see if you're really as good as Toronto. Would you go ahead? Okay, well, thank you, Mayor Goldsmith, and thanks for setting the table. What a hard dude. Whoa. Yeah, tough act to follow there, a tough, tough one to respond to. but. Uh, uh, I do want to share a few things on New York's experience as well as where we're going. Um, I'll, I'll give you a, a little bit of a teaser for starters, though. When the mayor talks about, when Mayor Bloomberg talks about having metrics at his desktop, he has them on his desktop, he has them on his laptop, he has them on his BlackBerry. And uh, as an example, we produce a report three times a day that he gets, and he does read it. And when the results are not where they should be, we hear about it. So he is a metric-driven, <coughs> excuse me, a data-driven mayor for sure. Uh, so I wanted to talk a couple of things, um, really just to um, 
give some some sense of um, <coughs> excuse me where we where we've been a little bit, but not so much about the history, but really where we are right now and where we'll be a year plus from now. So I, I kind of loosely table this as uh, growing, expanding, and evolving. And the uh, first piece to really kind of talk to is uh, a little bit of the background, a little bit of where we are. Uh, New York City 311 was built uh, for size and scale. We need to be able to handle the demand of the city that never sleeps. We uh, do have a large volume. We do, on average, 42,000 calls per day. We have over 3,000 unique services available to our customers. Uh, that can range from anything from information about a pothole to a social service to uh, uh, information on a park. We have uh, 180 languages available to us. We don't do them all here by any means, but uh, we use an interpreter services uh, like, every, like other centers do as well. But it is available to, to customers uh, in multiple languages. And that, that's a number of other factors below that, but we are built for size and scale for sure. And we had the fortune to uh, sort of be launched during flush economic times in the city. Uh, we probably would not be built for size and scale if we were launching at this point. The um, through, and New York City 311 is deemed a success. And you can measure that by performance, by customer satisfaction, and ultimately we measure it by utilization. Uh, some, some notes there and some stats there that I share. Uh, we are designed to have very quick accessibility. That's one of the tenets of 311 is have quick, easy, direct access. And as a result, we've been budgeted that way. We've been fortunate to be budgeted that way in the past. Our service levels are very high. Uh, annually last year, we did 96% service level within 30 seconds. Our average speed of answer was 6 seconds. And we continue that trend over the course of this year as well. Uh, the other focus we've been charged with is to have a very strong focus on customer satisfaction. La this past summer, for the first time, we actually did a customer satisfaction survey, the first real external survey. We're very pleased with the results since we really weren't sure where we would net out. We contracted with CFI who have, uh, have the pattern on the um, ACSI methodology. If anyone's familiar with that, you'll recognize uh, some of the scoring logic there. But, but we achieved a 79, which was uh, considerably uh, very, very strong performance. And uh, CFI uh, compared that to a number of government and private sectors, and we were very pleased to report that we outperformed not only the government sectors, but a number of the private sectors as well, which was a big milestone for us here and underscored a lot of the work that we've done in the last year or two on really focusing on customer satisfaction. And uh, I mentioned that ultimately our utilization. Uh, you know, customers do use 311 uh, for a variety of different reasons, but in the five plus years since we've launched, we've uh, received over 70 million calls into the system. So those are sort of our, our confirmations that we've been successful. There's a whole host below that. But uh, as a point of saying, what we're doing is good, and, and that's nice, and we, we take a little pat on the back at one point, but really that's just a little bit of fuel to say, now what do we do next? And then what do we do next category, really, that comes down to our challenge. Uh, our three tenants, or the three sort of uh, tenants of city government we have, uh, are to have it maintain accessibility, accountability, and transparency. So our challenge is really, how do we deliver on those three key tenants while we expand and evolve to meet and exceed our customer and our government needs. And I, I built a few things into that last uh, comment on the slide there. Uh, one to echo um, Toronto, ex echo what Neil said. Uh, we don't have the tri-actors here, but uh, we're kind of identifying two of the three that you had, uh, the customer and the government. A lot of times those are very different needs. And uh, you notice I put a few dollar signs in there instead of the S's because that's definitely a reality we're facing and every other municipality is facing as well. Um, the way we've done things in the past is not necessarily going to be the way we'll be able to do them in the future. So uh, we've had the blessing and the curse, if you will, that we've had good economic times to build out, but now we have to figure out how we're going to operate within a uh, much tighter uh, economic period here, at least in New York City. So that's sort of where we've been. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about where, where we are going or where we're uh, sort of evolving our, our expansion and our evolution, as I alert, alluded to. So we've expanded 311, and I'll talk briefly about that. The, the main area is really in the health and human services field. Around the U.S., and I believe in Canada as well, a lot of uh, municipalities use, uh, consider it to be 211. And um, we've actually not publicized the 211 method here in New York. Uh, we, we've used the, 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 the number, but we folded it into our 311. So our health and human services was really the first expansion, and really we've moved away from just providing government services 
to opening it up to really providing some of the health and human services that you don't normally get when you call a government. And also for us, it was the first real expansion into an area that the state was also heavily involved in and nonprofits, in this case, uh, the United Way and other nonprofits. So we actually expanded into an area that was beyond uh, the normal structure of a city government. And that's been very successful since launch in the end of 2006. We've had a significant uh, increase in that uh, with some system enhancements earlier this year, mid-July. A couple of other areas we've expanded into uh, or want to expand further into, uh, picture and video submission. We allow our customers to send a picture or a video uh, of a condition to further pass that along to our agencies that are the break and fix sort of agencies that go out and solve those problems. It's in its early stages. We launched it in September. And uh, we expect it will take off. Right now it's still fairly small. But we do expect it will take off and it's one of those future technology uh, drivers that we have. Multi-language IVR, in this case our IVR, we're referring to the integrated voice recognition. Uh, the, the, the menu you hear, the recording you hear when you dial a, a, a number. And in our case, we have a fairly thin layer IVR. But one of the things we added this year was recording and messages in six different languages. Uh, so English and then, uh, excuse me, seven languages, English and then six other languages. So customers can hear pertinent information in their language of choice, at least for those uh, additional six languages. And our last expansion is really going to be 311 Online, which is really about uh, taking the success and the information of New York City's 311 that you get in the phone channel and pushing that to the online channel. Our, our city website uh, that uh, we have is nyc.gov, and that actually predates 311. So it hasn't really worked well in terms of being able to be all things to all people like the phone version of 311 is. Our expansion into 311 Online in New York City is to do just that. How do we make it simple for the customer to know just where to go? They don't need to know who they need to reach or even how to frame their question, but they need to have an answer. And the idea is leverage the existing content that we have in 311 Phone Channel, but make it available in another medium, in this case the web. So those are expansion activities underway or planned in the near future. Um, but we've also evolved, and that's probably the, the main message of this story and, and the uh, kind of the strong link to the, uh, the leadership uh, theme that uh, we came out of in the, the next wave and, and when we had the session back in February and some of the recent uh, materials that Zach has pushed out. I'll talk briefly just on a couple of the evolution areas. And these are things that we've learned and have played well for us to kind of change who we are. We're certainly not who we were five years ago when we first launched. And hopefully we won't be the same that we are a year or, or five years from now. But some of the themes we came away with, you really want your 311 to become the must-have component of any of your city marketing and campaigns or programs. That takes a lot of effort on your folks who deal with the agencies and city hall and other operations groups. And a lot of it's about negotiations and just being, you know, just persevering. But we've really worked hard here to become the must have. If you're going to launch a program in the press and the media with subway ads or through any media at all, we really want 3 on 1 to be in early on the in planning stages, early on the advertising stages, to help craft that message, and then allow the agencies to use 3 on 1 to bring data in and not only service the main piece, but also uh, be able to you know, capture some demographic data and be able to filter that back. So that's really been key. And we also believe going forward in the tougher economic times, it's really going to help us sell the value of 311, whereas before it was a given. Now we're going to need to sort of sell that and quantify that. So a little bit of a Trojan horse on that one as well. Uh, the other area that I've really been pushing is to leverage our economies of scale in order to do different things. We're open to test and learn and trial and, and do experiments. We have, a, we have the size. We have the ability to do that. So it's good to try those. We've done a number of things. Just this past election day here in the U.S., well, we were bombarded with calls in, in New York State. It's the Board of Elections that's a, a, not a city agency, uh, but we help them out considerably by providing information such as poll site lookup. Uh, just days before the election, we discovered there was some other information we could provide, and we kind of changed it on the fly because we knew that would help the citizens. It may, it may have increased talk time or call volume to 311, but it was the right thing to do for citizens. Uh, we've done some things with public art projects and green support here in the city. Not big ticket items in many ways, but uh, this past summer, New York had a public art project called the Waterfalls. People from around the world came to visit it. And through 311, we actually set up a service where people could go to the site, see the waterfall, make a call, and actually get put into a recording which would have the artist himself describing what they were looking at at that moment in time. So we really took a kind of a social a public art program and linked 311 to it to enhance that a little bit. And green support, we have a Million Trees initiative here in the city as well where we made 311 a key part of that. 
and one of our favorite ones to reference and really pushes the boundaries of what you do in 311 is uh, an experiment last year when the, the New York Giants won the Super Bowl, the city decided to give them a big parade. And then the city decided to give away lottery tickets, uh, sorry, tickets on a lottery basis to attend the parade. So uh, in the span of uh, less than two hours, we had 45,000 people call 311 to register for the lottery to give away 300 tickets. Uh, so sometimes the best planning is done when you have no planning time at all. Uh, if we had a week to plan that, we may not have done it as well as we did with an hour to plan that. But it was another example of leveraging 311 uh, in order to try something different. And from that, we decided we could do that in the future if something were to happen. And then uh, the other thing that we've done here in the part of our revolution is to really use our capacity to diversify a portfolio. Um, we, we are a call center right now, and we're busy on many peak periods, but other times uh, we're not. We have capacity. So how do we use that to, uh, to better expand our, our capabilities as well as diversify our employees' portfolio as well as our business portfolio? So we've done things like outbound call, and we launched a program this past summer. Uh, we've done back office work where it ranges from stuffing envelopes to uh, our mayor's office of operations has a terrific program here in the city called Scout, which is actually uh, uh, vehicles going across every square mile of city street every month to record on quality of life positions. We help out with some back office work in that, so it's a good use in that, uh, that perspective. Uh, public tabling, it's uh, not to the scale I think that Mike is doing down in Miami yet, but uh, it's putting 311 people out in public at, at events, at fairs, at, uh, at uh, walkathons and things like that to get the message out. It's not only a great way to, to get information to people on the street uh, and in the public, but also to get great first-hand feedback, and it's a terrific motivator for employees to be able to have that opportunity. And then lastly, our training department. One of the first things we've done, uh, I'm sorry, one of the things we've done the last couple of years is to really tra change our training department to make it a key core competency and focus on customer service. And now through a partnership with our Mayor's Office of Operations, we're looking to expand that across all city agencies. So again, we're really leveraging our capacity and our expertise to expand our portfolio, which makes us better from a 301 perspective, but also hopefully puts us in a better position from a funding and a budgetary perspective going forward. So with that, I come up to the sort of what's next, uh, where we want to be a year from now, ideally a multi-channel, multimedia access to information, services, and assistance. That's where we want to go. It's where technology is going. It's where the user group is going to require us to be. A lot of people will still call on the phone, but there's a lot of people, whether they be the net generation, whatever gen you want to call them, um, but they're going to want to be online. They're going to want to text or chat. Uh, they're going to want to have broadcast, be it radio or TV. They're going to want to see you in person at kiosk. Uh, we also want to do reverse 911. Uh, that goes by different names, but basically have people sign up for text or email messages, and we'll push that information to them during an emergency. So all that is work uh, either uh, some of it's underway. The, the reverse 911 will launch in December. Our online is already up and running. Uh, the text and the chat is still in the aspiring stages, but we need to get there. And the reason we need to get there is uh, many fold, but uh, it serves uh, really the government, the taxpayer, as well as the customer. It's the lower cost self-service uh, alternative to a traditional phone center. Uh, we need to come up with these lower cost methods, and we need different ways for people to self-serve. So that's one of our active goals and plans for the next year. Um, I kind of skipped over a chart where really we um, identify that and link that back, but if any of you are familiar with the document and the nine imperatives for leadership, you'll see what I just talked about really ties into that. It's be fanatical about customer service. Maximize your efficiency through consolidation, integration, consistency. Uh, use 311 to enable data and analytics. And the one I think that's most relevant is deepen the value. And if you drill down a little bit on the nine imperatives, you'll see that's really what we're doing. That's really what's fueling uh, our expansion and our evolution. So um, those are really the, uh, the key points I wanted to share today. Um, one of the things, I, the last thing I'll mention is we have a terrific program here in New York City 311 that I encourage others to explore if you have the opportunity. And that's what we call our CUNY program. It's a college program uh, where we use college interns to uh, not only uh, handle us, help us with call center work and handle the phones, but we now have them on an intern program where we have different staff positions. and. Uh, uh, trust me, it's an invaluable resource that we couldn't, uh, couldn't use without, and including this presentation, which I thank Jessica Carr, our research assistant, for doing that as well. So thank you, Mayor, and thanks everyone for your time. That was terrific. Uh, let me ask you just uh, two uh, quick questions and we'll move on. Um, and uh, I'll ask them together. Um, first question, when you talk about the future of uh, posting videos, et cetera, uh, are those videos that would be posted for the information of city employees, like here's a picture of my pothole, 
Or, you know, in that book about, the most recent book about wisdom of crowds about the guy who lost his, a woman who lost her cell phone in New York City, or, or, or are they postings that say, here's the guy that I took a picture of that did a hit and run at, you know, 4th and Main, and so, you're, so the picture goes to the citizens, or does the picture only go to the city? And the second question is, 211, 311, 411, um, uh, do you think 211 is an advancement or just a fragmentation of what you're doing? Do you, you view that as a friendly competition, or would you rather just run it out of your own shop? Or do uh, you? A couple, of, a couple of great questions. Thanks. Uh, I'll do the, the picture video one first. And the short answer on that is those picture videos are intended for the city uh, to use to either augment the surfaces. Uh, so again, sort of the example of uh, here's a pothole. What's the difference between a pothole or a catch basin or a street cut, things to that effect? Um, so a citizen can take a picture of that, send that in either via the web or through an interaction with the 311 rep, and then it gets to ultimately to the to the city agency that that's responsible for fixing that. In the case of the more of the uh, crime-based, uh, such as the hit or run, or uh, it's uh, always famous here in New York, uh, occasionally. Uh, People on the subway do things they're not supposed to, and a lot of our citizens will take a picture of that, which has turned out to be very effective at uh, addressing that particular quality of life crime. Uh, you can actually send that in, and that will actually get routed to our police department through the 911 process, so they can use that in terms of uh, pursuing a case against the, uh, the situation or the individual. So it's definitely geared towards the city's use uh, to, to facilitate resolution of the issue. Uh, and then your second question with respect to the 211 and then sort of the proliferation of uh, really the other sort of N11s. Um, interesting question and, uh, and one we grapple with a little bit. From a public perspective, we've sort of taken an approach here in New York City that we were not going to advertise the 211 number because we'd already had a 311 and people knew about 411 and of course 911. Uh, a lot of the time and effort spent by 311 in New York City when it launched was to distinguish what's the difference between 311 and, uh, and 911. And I think, uh, I think Mike in Miami, his group really went, spent a lot of time to make that distinction as well. So we don't want to kind of include that proliferation. That's more on just the awareness side. But as far as absorbing a 211 into us, it was very different work for us. It was, it was a lot different than typical city uh, infrastructure work, city services, and, and I, what I like to call break and fix or you know, directory assistance type of work. It's deeper. It's understanding the customer in a different way and understanding the customer's needs because they're really not, their stated need may not really be what their need is. So for us, it really was a challenge to how do we change everything from our training to our hiring and how do we change our call handling. So uh, I don't know that it was friendly competition, so to speak, but it certainly was um, you know, an advancement for us to be able to expand our ability to deliver that service for the citizens. And then again, internally, it became a good career path for us for some of our employees as well to expand in that area. So, um, you know, um, I'm not sure if that's the angle you were looking for or if you had a little bit more specific element to the 2-1-1 question than that. No, that'll set it up. And if uh, uh, we have questions uh, after the next uh, couple presenters, then we can, uh, we can move forward. I'm just trying to uh, watch the other questions at the same time. Let's get, uh, get the last two and we'll go back to the question queue. So uh, many of these systems, uh, virtually all these systems, depend on the, uh, on the quality of the vendor participation. And uh, one of the uh, key partners here in a lot of this work, is co of course, is Motorola. And uh, uh, Jerry Gallant, uh, your turn. Great. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Uh, my name is Jerry Gallant. I'm the general manager of the Public Service 311 business at Motorola. And uh, I want to talk uh, a little bit today, uh, not about Motorola at all, but all about uh, mobility enabled 311 and what that really means for uh, service excellence, service channel of choice, uh, seamless service delivery, seamless mobility, uh, topics that you heard the previous presenters really hone in on, uh, Web 2.0, maybe that's Technology 2.0, Tough Economic Times. And I want to share with you some thoughts on what um, we believe and, and what our, our customers believe are technologies that are present today and that are coming that can help both uh, from a uh, city perspective, uh, county perspective, and also from a citizen constituent perspective. So um, I'm glad I have the opportunity to uh, spend some time with you. Um, Mobility Enabled 311 is what I'd like to talk about. and. Um, I'm hoping the slide builds. 
decide they're going to work. Uh, Gerard, uh, just a note on that. It looks like you, you've got it going, but this is um, if you just keep pressing your down arrow key or, or if you keep continually clicking on the slide, that'll make it build. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so again, topic uh, mobility enabled 311. Um, let's talk a little bit about the evolution of computing. Um, if one thing is real uh, post Y2K, it is that we are now in the age of mobility. We moved from centralized computing to distributed, to personal, to network, and I think we all agree in our personal lives and business lives that uh, mobility is here. Um, it's here to stay, and it's only going to be enhanced and help us both live, um, hopefully you would say live better, live longer. Uh, but live differently and interact with each other, our governments, our businesses, uh, friends, neighbors, uh, you name it. Um, it is here to stay and it is a, is a fact of life. And I'd like to talk a little bit about some technology and some impacts that that technology will have um, on how 311 um, delivers services to its constituents. Uh, we did a study back in 2007, and the numbers were, were a little surprising to us that 71% of decision makers around mobility say that mobility is more important to their enterprise today than it's ever been. We were a little surprised that it was that high a number. Uh, we also learned that Wi-Fi functionality is embedded into a, a ever-increasing proportion of client uh, devices, whether that's your smartphone, your um, handheld device, mobile computers, laptops, uh, you name it, the number of potential wireless users is growing exponentially, which tends to the point that no longer are we mobile and um, somewhat unenabled. We are now mobile and very enabled with uh, technology that will allow us uh, to do some wonderful things uh, in the field, on the street that we've never been able to do before. And one of the, out of our research, one of the uh, very interesting point that's points that are coming out is the mobility expectation is alive. It is overtaking the expectation of in-home or in-office service. Uh, I'll be interested to hear from uh, other attendees. Um, and I've got some poll questions that uh, hopefully we'll be able to distribute out. Um, the mobility. Um, Mobility is really an expectation now. Um, just like in your personal life, you, you don't expect to never not get a cell phone signal. And in fact, now you expect your data services to work everywhere you go, not just your voice services. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, the, the, the research we've done and, and, the, and what customers are telling us is that citizens expect to be connected everywhere 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And because of the impact of consumer mobile devices, what, what that impact has had on individuals, when those individuals become workers uh, during the day or during the night, um, they expect to be connected on the job just like they are connected in their personal lives. They expect to be connected at the site wherever they are, and they expect to be connected on the go. It is, um, it is uh, encouraging to see that technology has enabled connectivity and mobility across all realms, uh, whether you're at the beach, whether you're a service person, whether you are a construction worker, um, firefighter, police officer, public works, by law, you name it, technology has enabled mobility. What, what we believe is, is uh, the result of this is that mobility is really transforming the world in the way that um, we do business. It's changing the 311 landscape. And you know, just some salient points. Citizens expect to have 24 by 7 access to their government and information. Government teams, they need real-time access to information in the field. And and coupled with that, the economic challenges that are happening today and are cyclically happening uh, you know, throughout time, 
we all need to do more with less. And so oh, did I just lose it? Uh, okay, well I'll go back. Something happened. See if it'll come back here. There we go. I don't know what happened. We got a little technical grief here. Um, we all need to do more with less, and, and what we believe is that um, technology can help us do that, uh, do more with less. And I want to focus kind of on two, um, two distinct areas of 311, the constituent and the government itself. Um, what we're seeing, and, and I guess we'd like to talk about this, what if or when um, for 311 and mobility. What if you had fully mobile government crews that could walk, bike, or drive, that could be location aware, GPS capable, that could be fully image and video capable, that could be geospatially enabled and aware and the work they do tied to geospatially where they are existing, and that dispatched everything real time. What would that do to your service delivery and to your constituents? Um, if you think about some of these particular topics, um, these technologies that allow uh, both GPS and imaging and video and dispatch, all these technologies exist today. What we're seeing is that they don't necessarily all exist in a package to enable the 311 service delivery model where it needs to be and more research and more development is necessary to enable um, these technologies to coexist and so that governments can take full advantage of those services, uh, both from an applications perspective and a technology perspective. Equally, uh, equally as important is that not only do we want our mobile uh, government crews to be mobile, our citizens expect you to be able to handle uh, mobile technology. And we heard um, uh, Mike talk about channel of choice, service channels. Uh, we heard uh, our folks in uh, New York talk about um, different channels for imaging and, and video. So citizens want to be able to communicate with their governments in voice, in text, in SMS, uh, either and maybe MMS for uh, for mobile messaging, uh, email. Uh, what about mobile? Do, what about having mobile uh, NYC Gov on a mobile device to be able to do service requests on a mobile device with taking pictures off of that, as an example, um, or CityChicago.org. So uh, what we're seeing. As technology allows, as technology allows citizens to interact more with each other, they are expecting that same interaction from government. And it is our belief, um, as as a vendor in in this space, that that this technology has to come to the forefront because not only does it save money in the long run for constituent taxpayers. It also enables much more seamless delivery of service, and it fits where citizens are today, very mobile, very unique in, uh, in what they can do. And all of this is very new in the last several years, um, and now it's time that our business applications and business technologies caught up to with what our citizens uh, have been able to do. So I'd like to leave you with uh, with that thought and one other one, um, and that is something that uh, is a very interesting dynamic. Um, notwithstanding mobility in your 311 space and your ability to um, your ability to take advantage of technology, what about the convergence of public safety? What about being able to take advantage in the best way possible? of one of the largest 
government people assets that currently exist today and being able to use those assets for service delivery through technology advancements. So not only do our first responders, police, fire, EMS, or other first responders, responders have mission critical voice uh, devices, technology is here today and, and more is coming that will allow those responders to have mission critical voice with data services uh, all packed in one unit. And we had some very interesting discussions on this topic uh, at our last session which, which pointed to the ability, and some cities are moving this direction, where first responders are in non-emergent times are also able to assist with service delivery, but having the technology to be able to make that efficient so they're not wearing uh, you know, a non-emergent radio or, or another personal computer or another technology device on their belt or in their car that is integrated into the public safety technology. Um, we believe that this convergence of public safety, uh, both from a technology and people perspective and the colloquial uh, brick wall that exists between public safety and non-pet public safety it is slowly, through technology and, and new management practices, slowly um, coming, uh, not coming down, but um, slowly being reduced. And uh, it represents a fantastic, fantastic area for citizens of cities when public safety and non-public safety um, come together over time. So that's the last thought I'd like to leave you with. It's a, it's a mind-boggling thought of public safety um, being in the public service, non-public safety world. But it, uh, technology is coming today that will allow that to happen over time. That uh, is what I'd like you to reflect on. That's excellent. Let me, <clears throat> I have a question for you, but, and we have Zach to go, but let me ask. Um, uh, Elisa is, is turned purple here, which is, uh, it feels like there ought to be a more general color uh, to associate with somebody who wants to ask the question. But Felicia, you have a question to uh, the last presenter or generally before we go on? Uh, Steve, sorry for the confusion. I, uh, we uh, Purple means something different for this event. It uh, just means that okay. they've stepped away from their computer. So you change the colors for different events in order to confuse them. In order to confuse you. It's it's the only way I can entertain myself. Sorry about that. Okay. So um I don't I wouldn't want to ask Motorola to compare the cities that it's partnering with, but if you took your presentation, um what what uh, city have you is your newest what couple cities is your newest technology that would do as many of the things you just mentioned as possible be located in? Uh, so some some of the early adopters of the, the, the mobile enabled technology back before devices even became friendly is our, our good friends in Miami Dade County uh, a long time ago uh, implemented mobile device technology. Our uh, good friends in the city of Dallas here have implemented in car fixed mount mobile technology. Uh, our great colleagues in the city of Calgary have implemented um, our in, in, implemented fixed in-car technology. Miami-Dade really was on the leading edge of um, of uh, walk around um, walk around technology, um, and um, now that devices have caught up with um, with uh, now that devices have caught up with with uh, the technology, and you're now able to really have a device that uh, is ruggedized, is small, fits in the palm of your hands, we're seeing um, some, some great interest and we just completed a successful project in the city of Chicago where they'll be using that technology. It's interesting that the uh, technology has taken a while to mature to get it into a footprint that uh, you know, a, bike, a bike officer or a bylaw officer uh, on foot can actually utilize this technology, or it can be utilized in a in, you know in a hole in a pit, if you will, and you don't have to have it mounted in the car or the truck. Um, so early adopters from years ago, and then as technology has matured, um, some some new adopters of that same technology. Uh, great, thanks. All right, uh, Zach, we've heard some spectacular presentations. 
assume you're going to make uh, 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 abstract a few insightful principles which will make sense of all this. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not. I'll extract one very insightful principle on that. None of this research could have happened without uh, some good corporate support. And Motorola's here with us, but um, uh, we need to call out, uh, shout out, um, uh, Bearing Point, uh, Oracle, uh, Unisys, and Capital Principles as well. Uh, who are with us for the session, um, uh, together with Motorola. Uh, uh, their support made this research possible and uh, has brought us to this point. So we're very, we're very grateful. Um, uh, to all, all our corporate uh, partners for that, um, the presentations we've heard are uh, were terrific. I, I don't I don't want to stand in the way of questions and answers. Uh, su suffice it to say that when we brought uh, 20 or so leaders together, we thought 311 was important. We now know it's important. Um, uh, with the uh, with the financial pressures that city and regions face, uh, there are going to be challenges um, whether and how to expand, whether and how to even start. And uh, folks on the uh, uh, on the webcast today may have questions uh, for our uh, for our uh, uh, for our panelists about where do I start or how do I uh, cross that divide? Um, how do I uh, make the next the, the next move here? We also need to think about what the opportunities are. Uh, for federal support uh, for some of the uh, initiatives here. If you think about 311 uh, being uh, successful in pockets, how can we regionalize? How can we ensure that um, 311 moves to all cities and towns if that's appropriate um, and, uh, and areas that might not have the density of population necessarily to afford but certainly need the service benefits that 311 offers. Uh, so uh, as we turn to a, a new administration, new opportunities, um, uh, certainly that's, that's an agenda item that um, they might want to focus on, but uh, I want to turn this back over to our uh, to our participants, uh, to you, Steve, um, uh, so that we can uh, go forward with questions and answers and, and make the best of our time together. Thanks. Okay, so um, uh, we have several questions in the queue. There's uh, there's a question. Uh, if you have a then do, do 30 seconds of just renewed tutorial real quickly in case somebody came on late about how to ask. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, so uh, this is Jim Cooney from the um, Government Innovators Network. And just to review, if you wish to submit a question, you may do so using the question and answer window at the bottom right side of your screen. Click on the lower of the two fields, type in your question, and then click the Ask button. And then um, our moderator, Mayor Goldsmith, will, uh, will get your question queued up in the list. Right, so, um, and I'm going to ask the. the uh, um, I'm just going to ask questions generally and ask the uh, presenters just to kind of chime in. But, uh, but the but the cities that presented just uh, uh, go through one at a time. Uh, this was maybe three key metrics. Uh, how many call? How many? Uh, how big's your uh, staff in your call center? How big's your technology staff? And. What's, what's one key metric of, of volume that you measure, just so everybody listening can kind of do their own division if they will. So let's just run down the, through the list, starting with Miami. It's kind of the same order. Just, just kind of tell us a little bit in terms of size and, and, and support services. Uh, we've got a 125 uh, call specialists at the call center. And we have, um, see, we've got our e-government solutions team, which is kind of our in-house uh, technology team for integrations, and um, that team's about seven people. Um, kind of call it a kind of boutique IT shop. And then we also uh, have a, you know, we we use the county's entire IT department, the uh, department, for most of our infrastructure needs. Um, now we've got a metrics team of uh, about six or seven people in charge of metrics, and. Um, go down the list in terms of the web, we've got about 20. So the entire department's a little over 200 in terms of the government information center. Um, and uh, that's it. Yeah, just real, for you, how do you, how do you relate your walk-in staff to your uh, the call center technologies and web support staff? I mean, how do you? Well, the, the walk-in and the outreach program is something that, that is, that's, that's what we're looking at doing for this year. Um, we are right now trying to integrate uh, using kiosks. So we're actually trying to take our web sphere technology that we've been using online um, and make sure that that plays well with some of the online interfaces. Um, we also have our online um, intake component for the web. 
that we plan on also being able to use online and that integrates with our Motorola application as well. So, um, yeah, it, 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 quite a few things that we're doing on the front end to make that happen. Of course, in the back end, um, with our data warehouse, we're making sure that we're able to get access and visibility over what's happening across all the channels. Okay. Other cities on just a size scale? So from New York, and I'll just give you a little perspective uh, using sort of the same uh, same criteria. We have uh, over 450 call center representatives, uh, a 300 plus that are full-time city employees, and another 130, 150 or so that are college interns that I mentioned earlier. We have uh, about 85 uh, or so support staff that uh, you know, circle around the call center to support that, be it anything from supervisors and managers of the operations to a uh, content team, a quality assurance team, a training department, et cetera. From an IT perspective, we're sort of a combination. We have uh, 100 uh, agency employees that support us. We happen to reside within the, the CIO group within the city. Uh, our agency is have access to quite a bit of technology strength uh, within uh, New York City 311. Metrics I mentioned a couple earlier, but you average 42,000 calls a day, and, and that truly is an average because Mondays are obviously much higher than Sundays. And then, um, but many days uh, over the course of the year will be over 100,000 calls in total. Uh, this past week uh, for the election, we did 125,000 calls on Monday and Tuesday before and, and election day. And uh, so we do have a significant volume in that respect. The, uh, the metrics that we use, and, and I alluded to earlier when uh, Mayor Goldsmith referenced uh, the New York City Mayor, Mayor Bloomberg, uh, we do have uh, metrics that the mayor looks at every day and, and the city looks at every day. A couple of the key ones are our service level. I mentioned that's 90% or better within 30 seconds. The other one that we think is fairly unique to us and for all my other 301 partners out there, I hope it stays unique to us so you don't have to deal with it, but uh, it's a uh, max wait time metric that no call shall ever wait longer than three minutes to be answered. And 99.9% uh, .9 of the time we, we nail that one, but um, at times uh, we do go over three minutes for various reasons, And uh, but it's a key metric that gets measured to make sure there are no wait time, no long wait times getting into New York City 311. Workforce managers cringe when they hear that, but uh, that's a metric that makes sense. Thanks, Greg. Let's, uh, if uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, um, Mr. Mayor. I, uh, this is Jim Cooney again. I just wanted to make a one more general announcement. It sounds like we are getting some uh, some wind howling or, or something. So if everyone could just remember to mute their phones when they're not talking, that would uh, that would alleviate that. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Going to say that. Any other uh, any other aspira any other uh, uh, metrics that either one of the other cities are using that uh, might be helpful to those who are listening to the call. Uh, yeah, Neil Evans here from Toronto. I'll just sort of chime in. We're not up and running, but uh, as I identified uh, um, in our slide, we're looking at about, uh, um, by the time we go live, we'll be probably up near 150 uh, um, CSRs. We have a, um, we have a, de of our dedicated IT staff, we'll be looking at about nine, but um, as like, like New York and uh, Miami-Dade, uh, there's a whole infrastructure behind us of our call, uh, our support desk for the 24-hour support, uh, for some of our maintenance for the, uh, and support for the servers are all embedded in uh, our IT section, so they have to be added on, but we just have nine sort of dedicated to ours. Um, certainly, uh, our key metrics uh, will be call volumes. We're real nervous about this. I've seen some of the, uh, some of the information come out from uh, uh, let's say San Francisco, I think that uh, was identified as uh, one point uh, or sorry two million when they uh, first uh, started and they ended up getting three million in the first year. Um, New York, I think had a huge what was it one point two million in two thousand and three uh, and you you exceeded that uh, so that makes us real nervous here when we're when we're anticipating about two point five million calls what we're going to get and it's unknown so and obviously call to answer we've built our uh, agents on the on the uh, call to answer, and I guess the last ma uh, metrics that might be of interest is the um, talk time. Um, certainly, uh, those are all our initial um, interests uh, um, here. If we have, um, you know, not a lot of cities that 
size of New York or Toronto. We have a number of different size cities on the on the uh, call. But um, um, we got a couple of questions about cost, and this would be so complicated to answer. But let me just maybe Miami Dade. Um, if if you were starting today to build the model 311 that incorporates everything people have been talking about, um, tell us how many people live in Miami Dade and what you would guess the cost would be to stand up that uh, first capital and then personnel. If you got any idea, just as just the back of the envelope, so 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 you can properly shock the rest of the people on the phone. Oh wow! I mean, we've got you know we've got 2.4 million residents that um that we're looking at. I mean, if we're talking, you know, I'd be happy to email all the, these numbers out. We were actually just looking at some of those. We're doing quite a bit right now that we haven't done in terms of return on investment because we had quite a few capital dollars to get us started up with 311. And we're sort of, this is one of the discussions that came out of, of um, you know, I remember being, a, when we were over at Harvard, was what are we going to do now to continue to sustain um, our operations? And, um, you know, calculating return on investment is is a massive undertaking just because of the complexity of these kinds of, of systems. Especially now that, you know, again, I've heard everybody talking about kind of looking at across all the service channels, um, which is really what the customers are demanding. You're looking at web, you're looking at um, at all these pieces, and, and these things can get can get can get costly. Um, I, I I really wouldn't be able to give you an exact number. Yeah. We'll just ask anybody who has that information to send it to Zach, and we'll post it on the site, and that'll be a yeah. I can definitely get that for you, and we'd be happy to send it to you and and uh, and blow everybody's minds because <laughs> it 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 will really get up there. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Steve. Would any of you who um uh any of you on the phone uh, you know, presenters um comment about how you deal with child abuse and neglect calls that come into three one one? Do you? Take them? Do you divert them? Uh, do you send them? Where do you send them? Any comments on child abuse and neglect? Or requests for health insurance? Just general health questions. We've got several several audience questions about the kind of social service, child welfare, health issues that that um, need a resolution. Can't just get queued into the uh, normal kind of software. Any comments? Stephen, it's Joe Morris. So I'll be glad to. Um Give some information on how we're handling that here, both in in 311 and what we called earlier the 211 piece. Good, thank you. Um, on the more sort of the more urgent and, and challenging one, you mentioned sort of um, child care, and uh, I don't know if you mentioned it specifically uh, ch child abuse and uh, domestic violence. One of the things we do here at 311 is, is heavy training on getting a call that comes to 311 if it needs to get to 911 uh, to immediately get that call over. That's called a hot transfer. So. You know, that, the 911 folks are the experts at handling emergency situations. Um, so that's something that's in progress or imminent or danger. But if it's sort of uh, an ongoing, um, which is what I suspect your question really is getting at, um, you know, if it's a chronic situation, if it's someone exploring the situation, that's a real challenge for us. Um, our, our call center reps are not, you know, not trained to be able to handle with that, both the depth of that as well as even the vicarious trauma associated with that type of a call. Um, so we have some city agencies here and some nonprofit agencies that we work closely with to we'll do a little bit of probing, a little fact finding with the customer and then transfer them on over to those agencies and it's always sort of a, a hold your breath type of moment because you don't want to lose that customer when they're in need and you want to hope that they are you know confident enough or comfortable enough to be able to share their experience with whoever they get within the other end. So that's a challenge for us. Um, and a little bit more in the social services work, that's an area that we've really grown into as I mentioned before. And um, we find that we're using technology to help us solve some of those uh, tougher upfront questions. I'll just give you a brief example. In July of this year, we deployed a new uh, aspect to our knowledge management system. Um, we happen to use the Siebel Oracle product. And we created something called Related Services. So if someone's calling asking about food stamps, in the past we would just refer them on to the local food stamp office or the right telephone number to call. But now through Related Services, we have the ability to probe a little bit more with these customers and the system will actually prompt our representatives to push to say, okay, callers who call about food stamps may also want to know about food pantries or green markets or housing assistance or job help. Um, so it's you know not not dissimilar to uh, everyone's really going on Amazon and uh, you know people who bought this book tend to like books by these authors. 
So we've kind of taken that concept and built it in here. So it, the system's really helping guide our reps to help better serve the customer and unlock what that real need is as opposed to what the, state, the stated need is. So it gets, allows us to delve deeper into the customer needs. So a um, little bit on, on, that, um, on, on that topic, as you had asked. Other comments uh, from any other speakers on that question? Well, just to hear from Toronto, I mean, the interesting thing, we were down at, uh, at a uh, user conference in uh, uh, New Orleans back earlier, and one of the main uh, sort of debates between our Canadian uh, group and, and the U.S. group was this whole thing about privacy. And certainly when you talk about those issues, that's the first thing that comes to mind. And the, the uh, level of, uh, of privacy uh, that we're held to here, uh, some of the privacy legislation is specific to our provinces up here. So in Ontario, the uh, legislation we have, as well as the federal legislation, um, really offers some huge constraints for, um, and not, not to say that we can't do it, but huge constraints, which makes many of these uh, uh, getting into pr uh, personal data, uh, personal load of information, uh, very, very difficult. In fact, here uh, in the city of Toronto, we don't load personal data into our, we don't have screen pops with personal data based on um, uh, population roles or voter roles or whatever they're, they're termed in uh, the different jurisdictions. So um, many of our cases, it's as, uh, they're, they're certainly just a warm transfer um, and we can't even deal with uh, information from our, our own departments that have personal uh, data like our uh, our public health department we need to transfer those out so it is uh, it may be an, an, a good discussion for future uh, uh, the um, the privacy and accessibility questions uh, um, from across the border because they are different um, we got uh, lots of questions I'm going to try to um, consolidate the thoughts here um, there's one, there's one set of questions that deal with labor management inside the uh, 311 Center. There's another set of questions that deal with performance management as a result of the data collected in the 311 Center. So let me start on the performance side. There's a lot of very sophisticated questions. So, um, uh, you know, I was mayor so long ago that um, when we started the equivalent of 311 Center, it was so we could make it easier for people to call so that they can more conveniently call for services that we perform badly, right? Uh, which felt like not a total success. So now uh, the uh, folks on the call have these systems which connect the front end to the uh, uh, service software that ma manages the workflow and then produces the metrics. So we have a series of questions on how much of this data that is collected in 311 Center goes to management, how much goes to the department directors, uh, how much do you participate in the uh, city stat uh, activities through the 311 manager. So what's the connection between 311 performance management, workflow management, and city stat? And why don't we go in reverse order here and, and, uh, and uh, have the presenters uh, uh, comment on that. And uh, we can start with the cities, or if, uh, if uh, Motorola has a perspective on that, that's fine too. So let's, uh, let's kind of go in reverse order. And, address the performance issue. Uh, so I'm gonna, you're going to make me call on people. So um, Joe, let's see. Uh, uh, Jerry, do you have a comment on that or should I kind of just go to Joe? Uh, why don't you start with our, uh, with our, our, our city folks and... Uh, All right, thanks a lot. Uh, Joe? Sure. Um, but New York is, is a little bit less in the, in the sort of service stat or comm stat mode, uh, certainly so versus Baltimore, Chicago, and some of the other cities. Uh, our approach is more about uh, pushing the data publicly to go transparent. And I'll ask Jim if you're um, able to do it right now. Jim, if you want to go to that second link I gave you that takes sure, us thanks. to our CPR um, website, I might be able to bring that up for folks. Uh, yeah, but I'll, I'll describe it a little bit. It, it's really capturing the 311 data going through a business intelligence tool, and then pushing that information out to the public. So it's not just a case of city managers or uh, deputy mayors, uh, some things of that nature. It's actually to get it out to the public. Um, and that's, frankly, sort of a way to put the pressure on. Um, the, the tool we have is very effective. Um, we use a, a, a business intelligence tool, and then we've kind of created this citywide performance reporting that the Mayor's Office of Operations uh, hosts and runs. 
and that provides data, all sorts of cuts of data. Um, it groups things into how well um, agencies are performing, how well specific areas are doing. Uh, it's not something a citizen could find their individual complaint and see where it goes, but it is something that uh, you could drill down on to look at performance. Uh, Jim's been able to put the uh, the site up here for us, so as that loads, uh, I'll kind of skip ahead a little bit here. There's something called uh, Citywide Themes. Uh, Citywide Homepage talks about it, but Citywide Themes, I'll just take you there quickly if I can and uh, give you a little flavor for how we measure sort of agency performance uh, across the city. Um, so for example, um, community services is something that we could look at. It may take a few seconds to kind of roll through here. And I could go to the Department of Sanitation and click on that. So just a few clicks away, and it'll produce for us sort of what the key metrics, as defined by the agency, by the and by the Mayor's Office of Operations here in New York City, the key metrics that sanitation needs to report on. And uh, it's probably not going to come up for us here. Sorry. Ah, uh, here we go. And it'll show you sort of you know at a high level what what are the indicators, uh, where are we moving. Uh, you know, improving or stable, which ones are declining but declining slightly, which ones are declining significantly, and then um, those are the types of things that are available. Um, if I can take another moment, I'll show you another, uh, if I can kind of get back there. Um, one interesting thing about this is what the public can use, and uh, if you bear with me for a moment while we just click on this one, the other performance reports, it'll take us right to what we call um, sort of like my neighborhood stats. And um, you can just click on that and actually see sort of the performance results that exist in the area that you live or the area you so choose to, to look at. Uh, anything from you know what's the how clean are the streets to what's the quality of life noise complaint uh, frequency to uh, a number of different factors. So uh, it's available to folks uh, because the theme is to actually push it online and and make it available and let the customer uh, and let the public so to speak really be your your uh, sort of your watchdog. So I won't, I won't try to go through it. It seems a little sluggish here trying to do it this way. But it's available if anyone wants to play around with our citywide performance reporting. Just go to www.nyc.gov and there's a link right to it. And you can find a, find a lot of stuff there. Uh, John. So you and Zach are going to put those, uh, that information on this side as well. Is that right? Absolutely, yes. Okay, uh, yeah, we have we'll have that on our resources page if we don't already. Um, and, and Joe, I'm sorry that uh, it, it's actually my computer that's a little sluggish. But if you want to direct me from here um, to uh, any additional pages so they can see, um, we, we can do that now. Uh, I think it's just there's a continue button on the page I was at, Jim, at the bottom. Here. Yes, that one there. Okay. Click on that. And then if you don't mind typing in street address under option 1, type in 59 Maiden Lane. And then uh, the borough, click on that and click Manhattan, or just M will work. And now map it to your far right, the little icon. And uh, that will show us what's available to, again, a city employee to kind of take a look at anything, but really what's available to, um, to the public. Um, you see the tabs. There's three on one statistics, but there are other tabs. There's health and human services related. There's infrastructure related tabs. Public safety and legal affairs. Um, interesting side note on the public safety ones, where you'll find some information on noise complaints and things of that nature. And, and one of the ways, you know, th there's still adoption occurring in this area. It, it's not necessarily uh, uh, all citizens looking at it on a regular basis, but it is there. And one of the ways you know you've kind of arrived when you put information out to the public is when it gets co-opted for different reasons. And uh, we hear stories often about how real estate agents use this data to advertise that the house they're selling is in the quietest neighborhood, the cleanest neighborhood, uh, the most accessible neighborhood, whatever the case may be. So that's sort of a validation step that people are using it. That's great. Uh, uh, thanks very much. Uh, Neil, uh, same response, but let me ask you to particularly I respond to another question that relates to this, which is, how do you measure and broadcast resolution as contrasted to volume of intake? You know, how quickly and how good did the pothole get fixed, or the trash get picked up, and if, you know, all the rest of those things. So, concentrate, if you will, a little bit for us on performance resolution. Uh, well, of course, you know, this, if this is for us right now, it's uh, virtual because we don't. Uh, um, we're not up and uh, uh, running till June, but uh, certainly what is in our uh, is in our plans is that uh, 
uh, we'll certainly make uh, available to the citizens. So as a citizen calls into the City of Toronto, we will give them, as we can enter a service request, we'll give them a service standard, a service number. So, and we will give them with this number, uh, a ticket number, a reference number, as you would call it. As when we give them, we'll also give them a service standard. So, we'll, if they're calling in about picking up uh, a fridge, for example, we'll say, okay, your fridge is going to be picked up in two days, and your service number is one two three. Um, they can call back in two days and one minute, and uh, or any time, and say, okay, I have uh, service request one two three, and these are the expectation. So um, not only do they get to check the status, so we can go in and see in the status the truck's broken down or, or you know there's been some incidents which has made that delay. We will then take that information and we'll aggregate that and we'll both push that to the departments and to the counselors uh, within that ward and we'll disseminate that information. Unfortunately, we don't have the ability yet, like New York does, to be able to put that information out to the public, which would be very valuable because they could start to make um, that transparent. Um, but certainly, the, um, the broadcasting of that information will start to create a picture for both the divisions and for the city as a whole on how we are uh, responding to, um, uh, to services in this case. Uh, two points of, of note in that is certainly the first is that it sets up expectations uh, for the customer. And one of the things that has often been a question, I'm sure many municipalities share this, is why would you spend the money on 311 and not spend the money on direct service uh, improvement? Uh, that will, you know, the money you spend on 311 could go and uh, let's say get a tree trimmed uh, quicker. Uh, certainly, one of the the approaches to that is to be able to say. Well, one of the things in giving service response or service expectations is you manage the expectation of the customer. And many times they are more comfortable knowing that the fact of when something is going to be done is, is better than them anticipating it will be done at some point. We had a call that uh, came in and we use this quite often is that the person moved into their house and the street light was hanging down. They called into uh, one of our departments to report this and every day they went out and saw the street light was the lens on it was hanging down. They got more and more aggravated. If they had have had a service standard in which we repair our street lamps in blocks and that block wasn't due to be repaired for three months, they would have ignored that standard light for three months. It's about managing expectations. So that's, I think that's one example of how we're going to uh, uh, broadcast uh, uh, service requests and service standards. I hope that somewhat answered your question. Mm -hmm. Good. And uh, we'll try one more performance question, then we're going to spend the last uh, 10 minutes on kind of how to manage um, the uh, call center. So let's look a little bit uh, at uh, the issue of performance management. I think Miami's, Miami Dave's the only one that hasn't responded to performance yep. management generally. Yeah, I think the, the first step for us in terms of performance management was the establishment of our customer service advocacy team, which is the team I'm primarily involved in. And, and really the model there was more, more so um, in terms of setting up the relationships with departments, not just thinking about strictly about the data, but really helping the departments understand the data uh, instead of just kind of you know, pushing it over to them. Um, that was kind of step one. You know, uh, step two is really taking that data and, and similar to I think what Joe was describing, um, we have our service stat tool, which is basically making the data available to all departments kind of on demand. So they're able to get actually and look at how they're performing on fixing that pothole, fixing uh, the tree trimming, and they're able to get that as they need to do it. They're able to map that information as needed. Um, whereas the CSA role is more taking that information and helping them in terms of the analytics. A lot of the departments don't have the staff on hand to actually understand what it is that they're looking at. Um, so the CSA is actually helping them do that, um, prepare monthly reports for departments um, that supplement the information that they can get on the fly. Um, we're actually now, and, and what I was mentioning earlier with our CSI initiative, is kind of taking that information, taking those monthly reports and actually pushing those reports out um, with more frequency. Um, what, what Joe was talking about in terms of transparency to the public is absolutely where we're trying to go and taking that information um, once it's warehoused and not just be able to push it out to departments with more frequency, but able to uh, push that out on our web portal and in dashboards that the public can understand very easily 
and see how performance looks um, in that particular neighborhood. Taking it to the next level, we were talking a lot about Web 2.0. We want to do a lot in terms of personalization on the web. So someone would be able to come online, um, type in their address, see where they're at, and aside from just getting local events, they'll also be able to see um, you know, service requests completed in their area. Um, they'll be able not just to see what's been requested, but actually able to integrate with our service direct applications and be able to request from a mapping tool. Um, so again, trying to bring all these pieces together, I, I certainly, you know, what Joe was mentioning in New York, that the public actually seeing this does, does quite a bit to put the pressure on, on the leaders. Um, the other piece is the county has its own performance management tools that it uses. Um, Similar, you know, it's, it's, it's the city stat equivalent. Um, and we, um, we're doing a lot with our integration teams to integrate with those systems. So we're pushing information out from our warehouses, uh, from our data warehouse directly into those systems. So instead of departments having to key in their data manually, uh, we want to make sure that this is, is, is flowing right into the system and showing up for the county manager to look at, for the mayor to look at, uh, for department directors to look at. Um, you know, whereas in the back end, we've got, you know, our, our CSA team is trying to kind of give the department directors the heads up, again, building those relationships on the front end. So when they do speak to the manager, they're not just hitting, being hit up with the, the statistics for the first time. Um, we've done some preparation in terms of giving the statistics, giving them some context, which is, is very important. Um, and occasionally, we'll also do some more in-depth kind of studies, business process analysis. Um, that we're probably more equipped to do just because we're looking at the data all the time. You know, we kind of what's, what's, we know what's happening in terms of its relationship with other departments, impact um, at the call center, et cetera. So um, we try to come at it from a few different approaches, but at the key of it is it's building these relationships and letting the departments understand that the data is there to help them out. We're not a very, um, it's, not a, it's not a gotcha culture, um, and we, we think that's pretty important. Hey, Mike, while we're at it, this is Zach. Just a quick question. Uh, you use Secret Shopper as a, as a quality assurance uh, measure, both uh, when you evaluate a prospective new partner to bring on your platform as well as your current operation. Talk for a moment about quality assurance, if you would, and, and how you use Secret Shopper for that. Absolutely. Um, we've got a, a couple different, I, I guess we'll call them legs of the Secret Shopper program. We've got a Secret Shopper program that actually um, we Secret Shop ourselves. We do about 100 calls. Um, uh, independently, uh, we use um, uh, FIU locally. Um, they've got shoppers. They're not just college students. Shoppers uh, all ages represent the demographic of Miami-Dade County. And um, they actually shop our call center. So that's kind of us answering to our partner departments and letting them know that we're performing to the right, um, to the right standard. Aside from that, we also shop um, departments that don't uh, – numbers, there's still a number of, uh, um, several numbers that exist outside of the call center. Um, you know, our 10-digit numbers that still live out there. And we shop those numbers um, as well and give departments kind of an indicator of how they compare um, across other organizations across the enterprise. So that creates some visibility about our operation. It creates visibility about their operation. And that opens up for some conversations um, where we can create some efficiencies maybe at the call center. Maybe it makes sense to bring those calls over, which at the end of the day is kind of the, the end game to bring all the calls into the 311 environment. Um, and it's a standard methodology that we're able to apply across the board. Um, it's, no, it's, it's notable to say, too, that we also do uh, in-person shops of in-person experiences. We actually have people riding trains. And, and um, we try to package this all together. Again, that theme of that seamless service, the customer sees the county as kind of one thing. And, you know, it doesn't matter which channel they're coming, uh, uh, they're coming through. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. All right, so we've got about uh, nine minutes, and so we've got about 20 questions. Doesn't divide. I'm not very good at math, but that doesn't divide very well. So, uh, and, uh, uh, Zach, let me just flag a couple. Would you, when you create with Jim your resource page, would you link other sources of information about 311? And would you also find a high quality mid sized city, smaller than the folks on the call, and put up their, how, how they go about it, how, what their budgets are, how they measure performance, if they have a high quality? You know, uh, city of mid size. Yeah, we'll make, we'll make every effort to. There's uh, there's uh, good references in the in about three three or four pages of citations in the back of the 311 report. They can get online either from uh, Steve's uh, website or from uh, from ours, um, and uh, we'll try we'll try to make those links for you. All right, good. Now, um, let me ask uh, our guests um, uh, very quickly um, to uh, explain a little bit about your management process. Uh, you have uh, union rules that uh, inhibit uh, 
uh, uh, uh, measuring the productivity of your own uh, call center staff. Uh, do you have a lot of part-timers or do, do, do the union contracts bar that? Uh, how do you train the folks in your call center? What's the turnover? Are there any incentives? I mean, a lot of questions, but just to just tick off the, the two or three things on uh, it, that relate to training, uh, recruitment, and management of the workforce. Um, and we might as well uh, let's just go in the original order. And this this may be your last time, so we'll we'll start with uh, we'll start with Miami and run down through the list. So, uh, um, uh, Mike, uh, tell everybody what you're doing that makes you so good. Oh, we're uh, we're, we're, we're training. Training does it. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. We have an, ex an extensive training program. Um, Year-round year, year -round training program, we've got a team of about six or seven uh, trainers at the call center um, who are heavily involved in our knowledge management and making sure that information is transferred over um, to the call reps. Um, right out of the gates, um, you know, it's a fairly extensive several-month training program um, um, to get the callers up to speed on, on all the services that, that we're handling over the phone. Um, it's, it's relevant to, you know, talking about, um, you know, bringing, um, you know, talking about bringing transit uh, on board. And that was a heavily unionized call center. So the transition to bring them over um, involved, w w was quite involved in terms of the union. And that, that really was one of the challenges. Um, and they, um, I, the, the rules changed when they came over the call center. There were certain things that they didn't have to do in the call center. There's a lot of things that, um, that we do that are uniform. Um, for things as simple as dress code um, were an issue, and those were things that they weren't able to address uh, at transit and on the transition um, really made a huge impact um, in terms of performance. Um, um, if you come down to our call center, it's a fairly open environment. You can see everybody. Um, you know, at transit, they were kind of locked up in, in smaller spaces, um, and that does a lot to affect the culture at the call center and, and how people are handling calls. Sometimes people don't think about those things. And you've got a uh, you've got one call specialist that's that's handling calls for an entire department, and they're holed up in a small office. Um, it's amazing what that'll do for for, for performance. Um, so those things definitely definitely made an impact. Training number one. Okay. Um, thank you very much for terrific work and your uh, presentation today. Let's go through the last few uh, uh, comments and we'll finish up. Uh, Neil. Yes, thank you. Um, we uh, certainly, when we developed our, uh, our call center staff here, which we're still in the process of, we had to uh, bring two unions into one, which is always a treat Talk about brotherly love. Um, so we ended up with uh, a, lo a local, what we call Local 79, which is our shop, but many of the people that were mapped over from the existing call centers into here came from different unions. So uh, we had a, a number of uh, real challenges in order to do that. So all of our staff here are unionized. Uh, we will have a uh, percentage of them which are part-time, and those part-time as well uh, need to be part of the union in order to work in here. So. That's created some challenges, and where the challenges really show up is within shift schedules. So we had to guarantee certain shifts. Uh, we couldn't rotate them through certain shifts. We had to um, uh, prepare because we have a counter service as well in here, so we had to go through a lot of logistics around whether they worked in the call center or whether they worked the counters and how that uh, rotated through. Uh, come to training. Uh, well, our training and recruitment is is, is sort of rolled into uh, one uh, in this. Is we have um, every one of our uh, staff potential staff are assessed under uh, uh, three different areas. Uh, they are assessed by a uh, by a web-based product which we call Skill Check, or which is called Skill Check, and we run them through uh, we run them through that. And they have to pass that, and then they have a written uh, exam. They have to. Uh, pass that, and then they have an interview. That is before they um, uh, they can come on, and then we provide them with 17 straight days of training before they go through a shadowing process uh, uh, in order before they can answer their first uh, call. Cannot tell you on turnover because uh, we haven't had anyone quit yet because we actually haven't had anyone hired. But uh, um, that's uh, that's. Uh, you know the I guess the pertinent po uh, points I can say, and I do uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, um, onto this. And I uh, really uh, I took a lot away myself from the other speakers, so I thank them.
Thank you for your uh, your good work and your time, uh, Joe. Sure, I'll, I'll give you a quick rundown on some of the same categories. Uh, I'll echo what Mike said: training, training, training. Uh, but uh, from a union perspective, we do have uh, our workforce is represented by four different unions, sort of similar to the story you heard, where you know different groups have had to come together from other city agencies. That's definitely been a challenge. Uh, it's the heaviest challenge for workforce management because of some of the existing rules. They were they had schedules that were city agency schedules, not call center schedules. If you kind of think of those as different items. So there's been challenges there. There's been some, you know, sort of cultural challenges. Um, a call center is really built a lot of times on on rewarding merit, uh, whereas city service has been tied more to tenure. So we've had that challenge. Um, we I mentioned with the CUNY program a few times. That's our college intern program. That's been tremendous in being able to offset some of those challenges by having the the CUNY students sort of fill in the nooks and the cracks that we have in the schedule. Uh, because of the limitations we have through uh, through the other area, but we do have a good working relationship with our locals. Uh, they do come together under one umbrella, and uh, our folks work hard at making sure that we have open lines of communication, which is uh, you know a way that you ensure that you you, you kind of have those those good avenues there. Um, just to pick up a little bit of what Mike said as well. We really have made a conscious effort to focus on the employee, make them feel good that this is a professional career, this is a professional job. Um, we do a lot of internal promotions. Uh, we try to reserve a number of the promotion, a number of upward slots are reserved for internal personnel, and encourage that a lot. We did a employee satisfaction surveys and really, you know, gleaned a lot of data from that. And we get them involved a lot of times in um, in events, whether they be in the call center, outside the call center. You know, a lot of the good basic managerial morale building types of exercises. Uh, but I think the biggest thing that works for us is the mindset uh, that people are here to serve the public. And uh, one of the, the kind of our catchphrases that our uh, folks use a lot is that customer service is public service in action, and we really have instilled that throughout the place here, and that helps a lot. That that helps overcome some of the challenges you get in those other areas. So that's uh, a quick rundown from our end. And uh, again, I'd like to extend thanks to, to Zach and Jim and uh, to Stephen as well as everybody else. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, to be on here. Thank you very much for your exceptional comments and the terrific work. Uh, uh, before Zach has uh, Jerry for comment. Yeah, I guess I, I will uh, respectively uh, uh, decline uh, talking about union topics. Um, but I would like to thank uh, you all for the opportunity to talk a little bit about where the where the future is going from a technology perspective and what technology and applications can do in these challenging economic times to really help uh, drive better citizen satisfaction, more, um, uh, more work for less dollars, and, and really get you to the point where your service levels, you can lower the amount of time it takes to um, actually get work completed because you're no longer waiting for the update back from the field. It's instantaneous with mobile technology. So appreciate the opportunity and uh, look forward to continuing uh, the research and support of the 311 uh, area in North America. Thank you very much. Zach, uh, last words. Uh, where will the resource pages be located? Will there be a blog? How will you provide continuing support for this conversation? Well, those are all big questions. I don't, I don't know the, uh, the detailed answers. Maybe Jim has some detailed answers. But um, uh, we'll, um, uh, we'll, we'll post that stuff up on the uh, Government Innovator site as well as on the LNW site. Uh, so people can ping back and we'll, um, we'll have that. But just a quick word of thanks to, certainly to you, uh, uh, Mayor Steve Goldsmith, also to our panelists, and again uh, to our corporate supporters, uh, Bearing Point, Oracle, Motorola, Unisys, and Capital Principles. Uh, special thanks to Kristen Howlett of DeKalb County, whose enthusiasm and support for this whole thing made it happen. Um, we're pleased to work with practitioners. Uh, we want to keep this 311 Next Wave conversation going. Uh, we think it's an important one. We're looking for, uh, for partners and for ways to do it. Uh, so stand by for updates. And uh, with any luck, we'll be back together again shortly. Steve? All right. Uh, Jim, any other comments before I uh, just say goodbye to everybody on uh, where they would find information? Yeah, so we have um, a resources page with a few links up there. And uh, any additional links that uh, we uh, talked about posting today will go there as well. And um, as far as the recording and presenter slides, those should be posted on our website in two to three business days. And you'll be notified by email when that happens. And uh, I'll provide a link so that you can get to it easily. 
Uh, Jim, could you put up there uh, my email and uh, and Zach's if you have it? Um, uh, uh, I'm Zach and I are both are continuing to collaborate on writing case studies about best practices in 311. We're very interested in following the uh, Web 2.0 uh, next stage, uh, kind of a combination of the mobility tools that Motorola talked about plus the 2.0 tools, looking a little bit at community engagement as well. So as uh, and finally, uh, looking much more deeply at performance management. Who, who, who uh, to some extent, the 311 uh, front ends uh, are totally dependent on uh, the quality of the back end service. So the extent that uh, that uh, 311 metrics align with uh, the city performance metrics, that we can uh, particularly interested. In communities where the city stat stat models are connected to 311, any of those places where you're all venturing, where we could learn from you and write about it, uh, so that others could be informed, uh, please email either Zach or me. And with that, we're adjourned. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Steve.